Pranam Dar and welcome back everyone to the final session of our Housing First Wales Conference 2022. I'm incredibly excited about this next session. Um, we're really, really pleased to be joined by Pathways Vermont, who will be talking about their experience of delivering Housing First in the USA. As part of the mental health system, we'll hear about their delivery model, the challenges and the success factors, as well as their impact of their project on people's lives and public services. In particular, they will share the expertise of delivering housing first in rural areas, which feels really timely in light of the Welsh Government's plans to expand housing first to all local authorities in Wales. I've seen these guys present before and they're absolutely fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be sharing their expertise with you today. So I'd like to welcome Jay Helms and Tia Lewis to deliver their presentation at our conference today. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we are from Pathways Vermont, and we're going to talk about our rural implementation of Housing First. My name is Jay Helms. I go by they, them pronouns. So I'm Director of Training and Advocacy at Pathways Vermont as part of our Training Institute. I previously worked as a service coordinator on one of our Housing First Act teams. Hi, good morning. I'm Tia Lewis. I am the Community Integration and Department of Corrections uh, Services Manager and I've been with Pathways for nine years, so I've had various roles during my time. Thank you, we're, we're very excited to be here. So where is Vermont exactly? Vermont is in the Northeast corner of the United States. We're kind of sandwiched between Canada, New York, New Hampshire, and in Massachusetts. And though we're a very rural state, we're only a few short hours away from New York City, Boston, and Montreal. So Vermont has a total area of 24,901 square kilometers, which makes us the sixth smallest state in the United States. Our population is about 648,500 folks. Our population density is 26 people per square kilometer. So it's one of the, Vermont is one of the most rural states in the United States. Yeah, and, and to reiterate what Jay just said, we, we're uh, less than 650,000 people in, in our state. And if you look at this graph, you'll see that the total homeless individuals between 2020 and 2021 more than doubled. Um, we attribute that to the result of economic loss during the pandemic. We also had a very much expanded motel response system, which highlighted how many more people than are typically counted were very housing unstable or vulnerable pre-pandemic. Um, because folks were encouraged to only be with their household during the pandemic, folks who previously couch surfed or traveled were now captured as they were staying in these motels. And so we also have more folks who are meeting that chronically homeless criteria. Again, if we if we look at this chart, we'll see that we have doubled the amount of people who have been captured as having a psychiatric disability. And then we still have a good amount of people who are experiencing chronic homelessness who also struggle with substance use. So our mission at Pathways Vermont is to end homelessness and offer innovative mental health alternatives. We end homelessness through our permanent supportive housing programs, which we're going to spend the most, majority of our time talking about today. We also offer innovative mental health alternatives. So I'm going to speak about that just a little bit. Um, we do offer those innovative mental health alternatives within our permanent supportive housing program. We also operate other programs. We have a residential program called Soteria. Uh, which is a five-bed residential program in Burlington, Vermont, for folks experiencing extreme states or what's sometimes referred to as early episode psychosis or first episode psychosis. We also operate a peer support warm line and we have a peer support community center uh, that during the pandemic certainly changed. It used to be a drop-in sort of space with a lot of in-person groups. Now there is some in-person peer support that happens, though they take a lot of precautions, and they're online support groups. 
So the effectiveness of pathways in the housing first model is demonstrated in this one statistic, I think. Uh, we have an 86% retention rate, housing retention rate, which means that 86% of the people who are housed through one of our various programs remain housed. Um, sometimes that means that they may go to more than one apartment because we do offer a, a try, try again approach. And we know that you know, people aren't instantaneously successful when, when their environment is changed. Um, so sometimes, again, people, people have multiple housing units throughout their time with us, but they do maintain homeless or housing and, and don't return to homelessness. Uh, since we began operating, we've housed almost 1,300 Vermonters in our permanent supportive housing programs and our rapid rehousing programs. In our permanent supportive housing program, we have people who have been with us since day one in 2010. And in our rapid rehousing program, it's a finite period of time that folks are with us. We just kind of give them that leg up to get into housing and get settled and, and acclimated to that new way of life. Uh, and Housing First, as I'm sure most or all of you know, uh, is a way of ending homelessness. Housing First provides immediate access to permanent housing and support services for folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness and have serious mental health challenges. Uh, and it is because of this particular definition that we do offer innovative mental health alternatives. As we move through this, uh, we'll talk about what we've learned practicing Housing First in a rural setting. And we will also talk specifically about our peer approach to Housing First, which is related to the way that we try to offer innovative mental health services. So Vermont Housing First history, we've been, again, been around since about 2010. That's when we first housed someone, um, was started in 2009 from Dr. Samson Barris, who created or founded the Housing First model, and the Vermont Department of Mental Health awarded a SAMHSA grant in 2009. Now, SAMHSA is Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So that was a grant awarded to us in 2009 with Hillary Melton, our founding and current executive director at the helm. Uh, shortly thereafter, we housed our first participant. And then in 2014, we had the honor of no longer having to rely on grants to fund our program as we were identified as a specialized service agency, which means we were now part of the mental health system of care. Uh, what this did was it acknowledged that housing first is necessary and an integral part of that mental health system. We could now, moving forward, um, bill our health insurance, bill Medicaid. So I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, the impact of our Housing First program. So as Tia mentioned, we've housed about 1300 folks. We're gonna talk about how that breaks down. So in our permanent supportive housing program, um, we've housed 300, over 300 households, folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness, Housed over 200 individuals who were previously in institutional settings, and then we uh, housed them. So folks who were, you know, who'd been in psychiatric institutions, for example, for a long time. So folks who were able to leave those institutional settings and be in their own home. We have an 86% housing retention rate of our population served in our permanent supportive housing program. 100% of those folks have a psychiatric diagnosis. 68% of those folks identify as having some sort of challenges with substance use, and 90 plus percent of those folks identify, self-identify as having experienced some type of trauma before in their lives. Now, how has Housing First impacted Vermont? Well, we gave a community orientation to Housing First. We introduced this rural state to the radical idea of, of Housing First. Um, we've had progressive engagement, um, 350 plus housed through rapid rehousing, and those programs include our supportive services for veterans and families, our Department of Housing and Urban Development, and our CARES program, which is a response to the coronavirus. It provided rental assistance for Vermont households who were experiencing that um, economic hardship due to the to the pandemic. So 
So a bit more about our housing first impact in Vermont. So as Tia mentioned, we do have the ability to bill Medicaid for services, which is a lot, which allows us to provide long-term support. As Tia mentioned, there are some housing first clients who have been with us since the program began in 2010. Uh, and it is our goal to be able to provide long-term support support for as long as folks who you know want to receive that support we want to be able to provide and so we figured out ways to do that um, we are the largest vermont housing authority sponsor in the state of vermont uh, pathways vermont is the first rural demonstration of the evidence-based practice of housing first so prior to our program uh, the evidence-based practice of housing first had only been tried in urban settings we are the first agency to implement that in a rural setting we are the first Housing First program to partner with the Department of Corrections, uh, and TIA currently heads that program. Uh, and as of July 2021, we provide Housing First services in nine of the 14 counties in Vermont, and we are always trying to expand. Thank you, Jay, for that little shout out. Yes, um, we are the we do partner with the Department of Corrections, which is a program I'm very, very proud of. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have numerous funding partners, the Department of Health, Department of Corrections, our agency is Human Services, the Veterans Administration, HUD Continuum of Care, United Way, University of Vermont uh, Medical Center and the generosity of private donors. Um, Pathways Vermont has partnered with various funders to sustain and expand our model across the rural state of Vermont. Through our partnership with the, the Department of Mental Health, we're able to support folks with histories of psychiatric diagnosis and incarceration and hospitalization to live independently in the community. Through our partnership with the Department of Corrections, we're able to support folks leaving incarceration as they reintegrate into the community. Uh, so again, they'll be going into independent housing as opposed to congruent housing, so like group homes. Um, and in terms of housing funding specifically, so where do we where do we get the funding for the actual housing vouchers for for rent to be paid? Um, we use HUD shelter plus care vouchers. So HUD again is the Department of Housing and Urban Development within the United States. DMH subsidy plus care vouchers. DMH within the state of Vermont is the Department of Mental Health. Uh, local choice vouchers, which is the Section 8 program within the states. And we have housing that is funded by the Department of Corrections and Pathways administers those funds. We also have folks who self-pay and there are other ways that folks are able to get their housing paid for as well. To piggyback off of what Jay said, um, some of these vouchers like our Shelter Plus Care, our Department of Housing or Department of Mental Health subsidy uh, require a sponsoring agency in order for an individual to utilize that voucher. And that's one of the ways that Pathways comes in and is partnered with that individual to sustain their housing. So if you didn't catch it the first couple of times that we, we mentioned it, uh, we have a housing retention rate of 86%. We're very, very proud of that. 93% um, of the time uh, individuals spend in the community versus in institution, which really highlights how housing is fundamental to one's mental health and overall well-being because they are spending so much time in their community and in their own units as opposed to those other places like hospitalizations. 97% um, of direct Department of Corrections participants are not charged with a new crime. That kind of emphasize, emphasizes how many crimes, not all crimes, but many crimes correlate with a person's um, need to survive, to meet those basic needs. And 75% of our current uh, participants were housed for longer than one year. We're going to talk a bit about the financial impact of housing first as well um, these numbers are a little bit outdated uh, though i think they illustrate the concepts all the same uh, so within the state of vermont at least um, it taught you know it costs about i think now it's about 45 dollars uh, a night to operate our housing first program and when we say 45 dollars a night that includes 
the rent, of course, but also all of our services that are available for through Pathways Vermont. And as you can see, that is the least expensive of all of the other options, including motel stays and also institutional settings like a correctional facility, an emergency room, or a psychiatric hospital. So not only are we just providing um, services where we have really good outcomes, again, an 86% housing retention rate, uh, Housing First just works better than any other sort of model for ending homelessness. Um, it's, also, it's also just less expensive, which I'm sure many or most of you know that already, but we do like to highlight it um, because it does feel really important to talk about how we can provide better, more person-centered services for actually a lot less money. And just to keep talking about money for a little bit, if we look over on the left side, the numbers you see there are six months before somebody began receiving Housing First um, support. And then on the, on the right, in the white, is six months after Housing First. Those are the costs to the state. So the graphic illustrates a direct comparison of the combined cost of service utilization by 129 clients six months prior to entering the Housing First program and six months after entering the Housing First program. So we can see there is a substantial difference. We're going from millions of dollars to just over a thousand dollars for psychiatric hospitalization. The correction facility, we're going from three quarters of a million dollars to less than a quarter million dollars. And motels, we're going from $151,000 to just under $50,000. So like Jay was saying, it's a very cost-effective way to provide person-centered services and housing to an individual. So we're gonna talk a bit about what we've learned practicing housing first in a rural setting. Um, and on the left here, just a little bit more trivia about the state of Vermont. So <laughs> we do have one cow per every 3.8 Vermonters. So there's a lot of cows in Vermont. Uh, there are no billboards in the state of Vermont. Um, and it takes as long to drive down the state as it does to drive across at least the top of the state, the widest point of the state. Uh, just to again highlight how very rural Vermont is um, and how it's very different from the urban settings that Housing First had been implemented in before, at least in the States. Um, and so some lessons that we've learned, uh, local champions are really important. And what we mean by that is really building relationships with folks who are like local shelter directors, for example, homeless advocates in, in individual communities, even folks who've experienced homelessness before. Uh, we really, we really see the folks that we provide services to as community members because they are our community members uh, and it's important to recognize them as such. When I worked in a Housing First program, uh, in our Housing First program as a service coordinator, um, I think the place that I lived in the, in the community that I was in, probably within half a mile of me, at least 10 of our service recipients also lived. Um, again they're just they're just our community members it's important to treat them as such uh, and again to recognize that 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 some of our folks who are receiving services from us can also be a champion for our services can help us advocate to get more services um, in vermont it's really helpful speaking of advocacy that we have an accessible legislature uh, we can do in-person advocacy things have gotten a little challenging with the pandemic of course um, though we can do in-person advocacy uh, our legislative, our legislative house in Montpelier, Vermont. You can just walk into the state house, um, and if someone is in their office, if a legislator is in their office, you could knock on the door and possibly speak to them that day. Mm -hmm. um, legislators are very responsive to their constituents, um, and so it's been important for us to know the folks who, you know, know our legislators and know the folks who work for legislators. We've really had to utilize technology um, to make this work. And of course, a lot of folks have been utilizing technology during the pandemic. We've been using video calls uh, to, to sort of manage our Housing First program for a very long time. Um, and it's been, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about technology uh, in a little bit. So we'll get, get more to what that looks like and how we've utilized that. Um, we've, 
you know, come to understand that that in small towns, there can really be a big impact that changes for a few individuals within a small community can really be felt and recognized by the larger community. Um, because Vermont is so rural and many of us are living in smaller communities, a lot of people in community tend to know a lot of other people in community. And so folks who've previously been experiencing homelessness are, are really well known within their community. And once those folks are housed, that can really have it, that has an impact of course for the folks who are housed and also for the community. And so it's been really important to recognize that. Um, car time, uh, we have a lot of car time. Um, and pre-pandemic, that was a lot of car time also transporting folks, you know, to different appointments. Um, I know that I, for example, would take folks to medical appointments that were an hour, hour and a half away because that was the closest medical provider that was providing the service that that person needed. Um, and so we really learned to utilize that car time to understand that while it, it was like a, a part of our job that maybe folks in more urban settings weren't necessarily experiencing like the amount of car time and transportation time that's involved operating this in a rural setting in a very rural state, we learned to utilize that time um, you know, an hour, hour and a half in a time with a service recipient is an, is an hour, hour and a half to build relationship and really get to know someone, uh, you know, so getting to learn about their life or looking, um, Vermont is really beautiful. So just looking at the beauty of Vermont together and talking about that. And sometimes people will talk about, you know, when they were kids and what they liked to do when it was snowing or hikes that they've enjoyed going on or we listen to music together. There's just all sorts of ways that we can utilize that car time to really enhance the relationships that we have with folks. Um, you know, as we've talked about with like local champions and small town big impact, just really understanding, you know, that local folks, um, that we are local folks, like the folks, you know, who live and work in our communities um, and just really having that emphasis on on, on folks who are local and on and like really embracing that we are in like rural settings and in small towns. It's been important for us to be really, really flexible. Um, and, you know, in, in all of the ways that is I think it's important to be flexible in general in a housing first program and urban settings as well. But it's been really important for us to be as flexible as possible. Um, we've also learned that lived experience is an asset uh, as we've talked about, you know, we are community members, like the folks that receive services in our communities, they live in the same community as folks who are providing services. And so we're all in community together. And some of our staff do show up to the work with lived experience. And we're going to talk a bit more about that later. Thanks, Jay. So our service array is that we have local service support. So like Jay said at the beginning, we are in nine out of 14 counties <clears throat> and they're highlighted here at the little pathways key on the map. We have regional housing. So our housing team is broken up by regions. So they may cover a few counties. And then we have the statewide um, leadership and administrative support. So they're accessible sometimes in person, over video, over phone. So we're all connected despite one person being at the top of the state and one being at the bottom of the state. We utilize a multidisciplinary community-based support. Now, what that means is that we have a variety of folks who comprise our teams. We offer peer support, substance abuse services, supported employment, uh, nursing services, psychiatric services. Our medical director is a psychiatrist and we have three additional doctors who provide mental health support. We offer 24 seven on call services and we provide service coordination with other providers external of pathways. And we also really um, strive to integrate folks into the community through various activities or resources that may interest them. Now by community-based support, what we mean by that is getting outside of the office, not meeting folks at the office in, in what may feel like a clinical or a stuffy environment, but meeting people in their home, at the library, going for drives, which is one of my favorite things to do with folks because it's a, it's a great way to open people up. I don't know what it is about a, a car ride, but conversation really does kind of start flowing. Um, 
during the pandemic, keeping a couple chairs in the back of your car and, and sitting at a distance, but still having that face to face interaction outside in a in a safe space where you can where you can build relationship. Um, going out for a cup of coffee, taking somebody to a food shelf or a doctor's appointment. We're really, really integrated into the community and that's where we offer our supports. Um, we use a team approach to services. So what we use is, is a modified ACT model. And that means that not one person holds an entire caseload. Instead, it's the team, the whole team who holds the whole caseload. This allows a participant and a staff to, to interact with a variety of people, thus expanding their community to really work with people who, who may have strengths in one area where another person may not, um, to switch it up a little bit, you know, to keep, keep things interesting. And if I were to go on vacation, I wouldn't want to leave feeling like I was letting the folks I support down because I know that I have a whole team that they can rely on and turn to for that support. So that's really a comforting thought, not only to myself, but to the service recipient. We have a lot of local connections. We work with pharmacies, primary care doctors, therapists, employment services, um, services connected to the Department of Corrections, faith-based groups, and emergency services. Um, though Pathways is still relatively young, you know, we're only about 12 years old, we're, we're known, we are known in the community. So if I call up emergency services or a therapist and say, this is Tia from Pathways Vermont, a lot of people will know exactly what program I'm talking about, what organization I'm referring to. And that's really great. That's, that's great um, to have that connection. I'm going to talk a bit about technology. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've been using virtual meetings for, for quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, which worked to our benefit when the pandemic happened, because I think a lot of organizations were trying to figure out how to go virtually. We've just been doing that for quite a long time. We're spread out throughout the state of Vermont. Um, many of our ACT teams, you know, in different communities, different counties do frequently meet together. So we were utilizing virtual meetings to do that. Some of our service recipients in the southern part of Vermont, for example, might meet with the psychiatrist who works in the northern part of Vermont. They do that by having a virtual meeting. Uh, among our staff, we have a lot of shared resources. We use the Google suite of apps, uh, which really, you know, really helps us. Um, and so we have calendars, we have our contacts uh, through the Google suite of apps. Um, and we also have a lot of shared information on Google Drive, uh, which just makes it easy for folks to access the things that they need to access. We do utilize paperless ACT meetings. Um, so, you know, ACT meetings, just part of, part of a Housing First program when ACT teams come together each day to talk about what's going on, figure out who's supporting whom, what kind of support that person might need. We do that in a paperless sort of way. We keep track of that via Google Sheets, uh, spreadsheets, in the Google suite of apps. Um, we also have some statewide online communications. So of course we're, we're utilizing email and things through the Google suite of apps, but we also have fax and phone. Um, again, it's just, I think we were at, again at a bit of an advantage when the pandemic began because we were already just really in the practice of, of utilizing virtual meetings. Um, and so a lot of our staff had a lot of comfort with that. And then we're able to support once the pandemic began uh, we were able to get some money that we then provided some of our service recipients with phones or computers so that they could have virtual meetings with staff. And so our staff were able to support and getting that set up and guiding those service recipients as they were, some of them learning how to really use uh, things like Google Hangouts or Zoom for the first time. <clears throat> So how does Pathways Vermont uh, practice a value-based service philosophy? We do that in a, in a number of ways. One is through individual choice and self-determination. So we 
create person-centered service plans and provisions. What that means is that um, our service plans are a reflection of, a, of an individual's self-identified goals and the ways in which they feel they can accomplish those goals. Uh, we regard each person as the expert of their own experience. We're here to, to listen and learn from that individual and who they are and what works for them and, and, and doesn't work for them um, versus telling somebody what we think is best. Um, we strive to minimize coercion, which is where that comes into play. Uh, we provide trauma-informed services, spaces, and relationships. Uh, at Pathways, we recognize that trauma is often fundamentally about a loss of power, and we seek to build mutual relationships and meet folks where they're at while understanding the inherent power imbalance between service provider and service recipient. Um, we practice a harm reduction uh, model, so we, which brings us back to choice and self-determination. Um, we want to do we want to minimize the amount of intervention that we provide to an individual so not to re-traumatize them or just kind of overdo it for unnecessarily. Uh, we offer peer support, which is where that lived experience that Jay had touched on comes into play, and community integration. Pathways is, is a nine to five Monday through Friday operation. So we want people to have supports outside of us you know, on the weekends, at nighttime, when they're not scheduled to meet with us. We want them to be able to feel like there's other people that they can turn to and get support and connection from. So I'm going to talk a bit about our practice of peer support and what, what it is that we mean by that. And our next several slides are going to focus on what is, what is peer support? What does that actually mean to us and how do we practice it? So Pathways Ramada is inspired by Intentional Peer Support, which if folks are unfamiliar with that organization, you can look them up. Uh, Intentional Peer Support is a relationship framework about how we show up in relationships with each other. Uh, it's it's utilized among many service providers in their relationships with service recipients. It's also, I think, just a meaningful way to show up to relationships in general. This is how we practice this at Pathways Vermont, how we practice our peer approach to relationships. So we start with valuing lived experience and recognizing each person as their own expert, as Tia already mentioned. We do our best to foster connection and build relationships through empathy and authenticity. We center mutuality, mutual responsibility, and mutual support in our relationships. We work to preserve autonomy and choice. And through all of this, we are constantly exploring opportunities for meaning making and transformation with the folks that we provide services to. And with the next few slides, we're going to talk through what each of these means. So why do we practice a peer, uh, a peer approach? Well, ending homelessness is not us versus them. Uh, it makes it truly person-centered. It makes our work trauma-informed. We believe that humility begets curiosity and openness. Relationships are more sustainable when there's that peer element. It co that collaboration minimizes coercion and practice empathy versus having all the answers. Service providers are not whole and service recipients are not broken. We believe that we are all part of the human experience, that we must all have each other's backs, that service providers and service recipients are in community together. Trauma, um, we also believe that trauma often includes a loss of power or identity and sharing power in that mutual relationship formed from a peer approach and focusing on mutuality can be healing. When service providers approach service relationships as an expert, they may miss opportunities for growth and learning. Again, it's not us versus them. It is a collaboration. Each person is able to talk about needs and negotiate boundaries in an ongoing way. As a service provider, it's equally as important for you to identify your needs and your boundaries as it is to know what a service recipient's needs and boundaries are. And resentment is li less likely to build when folks don't feel locked into inflexible dynamics. A few slides back, Jay said that Flex, being flexible was fundamental to the work that we provide. And that's very true, even more so when you practice a peer approach. Or when you're going through a pandemic. <laughs> yes, for sure. 
Um, so how do we value lived experience? What is it that we mean by that? Well, as we've said uh, before, and we will just say it many more times, we'll say it within this presentation, we say it all the time at Pathways Vermont, we really do trust each person as their own expert. We trust that each person knows themselves best, that they know what they need, that they know what works best for them, that they understand what their goals are, that they know what they want their life to look like. And as such, we trust that each person has wisdom and insight from that lived experience, right? So often within systems, folks who are receiving services, like folks who've received psychiatric diagnoses, for example, or folks who've experienced homelessness before, folks who've had a history or currently struggling with substance use challenges, folks who've been incarcerated. So often these folks are treated as if they're fragile, as if they can't make their own decisions, or as if they somehow don't have wisdom and insight into those experiences, which we just know is not true uh, based, on, based on the many service recipients that we've worked with, and also based on the lived experience of our staff, because all of those experiences I just listed we have folks on our staff who've had those experiences as well. Um, and so we really do understand that practicing humility, uh, having a humble approach to relationships, that that is just much more valuable than trying to be competent, quote unquote, competent in someone else's experience. We are never actually going to be competent in someone else's experience. Someone may be, you know, an expert in social work because they have a degree or someone may be an expert, you know, someone who's like a doctor specifically practices internal medicine, they may be an expert in that. They are not an expert on the person that they're providing services to. And that's the really important difference, right, is that folks may be experts in their fields. They are not experts on the individual people that they provide services to. And it's so very important to remember that each person has wisdom and insight into their own experience and to really practice humility when showing up in relationships with service recipients. So how do we foster connection? Well, as Jay eloquently explained, we've all kind of we've all been there. We all have our own lived experiences. So we come from a place of empathy and non judgment. And again, this, this highlights the importance of utilizing that, that team approach. I may have one experience and Jay may have a different experience. And so we can relate to an individual in different ways. Um, we have that staff with lived experience and Jay just listed many different experiences that some of us have, whether it's homelessness or a history of substance use or mental health diagnoses. Our staff have that lived experience to connect with our service recipients. And we focus on relationships, on building relationships, on connecting after a disconnect, on growing and learning together. We support staff to share relevant experiences to build and deepen relationships with service recipients. Um, we use our own, own life experiences um, to to not only highlight that that we've been there and, and, and we know what you're going through, um, but to also deepen those relationships through connection, through that shared experience, if you will. Similar experiences. <laughs> so how do we center mutuality in our relationships? Um, first, I wanna talk about what we, how we understand mutuality and what that means. I think so often, Folks get a little tripped up when they're thinking about mutuality, particularly in service relationships, because I think sometimes folks think that think that mutuality means equality, um, and that's that's really just not what is going to happen in a service relationship. I, I think we can strive towards equality, and also we understand that there is an inherent power imbalance in those relationships because one person is being paid, one person is not. One person is bound by program requirements and expectations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we navigate that. When we're talking about mutual relationships, we're talking about a shared understanding of the relationship. And what that means is that each person understands what the relationship means, how the relationship works, that each person is able to articulate their needs, beliefs, expectations, boundaries, and limits. Um, and we also understand that each person has a capacity to contribute to that relationship. And sometimes that capacity changes day to day and can be negotiated from interaction to interaction. 
And so we really do focus our relationships on co-creation and collaboration. So each person, again, gets to talk about their experiences, their needs, expectations, boundaries, and limits. The services that we provide are collaborative, right? It is, again, not that the service provider is the expert and knows what the service recipient needs. It's that we're collaborating together on this journey together, just trying to offer support that is meaningful and useful to the service recipient and have that support be something that the service provider can agree to. That's where the mutuality comes in. Um, we really want to, you know, to like follow through with that co-creation and collaboration. We then share power and decision-making as much as possible. And so when we talk about being aware of that inherent power imbalance, we encourage our service providers to give up power as much as they can in their relationships to really share power and to not lean into the power that they have, rather to share it and to share uh, decision making as well. Um, it's important that we treat our service recipients as equals because we are all human beings navigating a world with our respective wisdom, insights, strengths, and challenges, right? That like. It's not just service recipients who have strengths and challenges. It's our service providers as well who have strengths and challenges. We all show up every day in our lives with strengths and challenges. And really understanding that is really important. Um, we do our best to minimize resentment in our relationships because we want the relationship to be sustainable. That's why we're talking about minimizing resentment here, right? We want to provide support for as long as possible, for as long as it works. And we want those support relationships to be sustainable for the person receiving services. We also want them to be sustainable for the people providing services. We're very invested in like staff retention and in a way to, you know, part of again, building mutual relationships is because we want to minimize that resentment. We want to make sure that folks feel able to show up as themselves to their work and talk about their needs. Um, as I mentioned before, we are we are all human beings. We all have strengths. We all have challenges. We all experience struggles. We also all experience joy. And really remembering that is really important as we show up to our relationships. Um, and as always, cannot emphasize enough being conscious of that power and the power imbalances and doing as much as possible to share power and decision making in relationships. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for sticking with us. We're going to go through these next couple of slides uh, fairly quickly so that we can get have about 15 minutes or so for your questions, which we're really looking forward to. Um, so how do we preserve choice? We do this through autonomy by, like Jay said, encouraging like collaborative decision making or identifying next steps together. Um, voice by by supporting somebody to use their voice, to advocate for themselves, to, to speak up and identify what they need, what their needs are and what their wants are. And we really practice doing with someone instead of doing for. It's very easy to complete an application for somebody or to run to the food shelf on behalf of someone. But what we want to do is minimize that as much as possible and make it like a collaborative team effort. Let's complete this application together. Let's go to the food shelf together, you know? Um, so that's what we mean by doing with instead of doing for. And then last, you know, I talked about exploring opportunities for meaning making and transformation in relationships. How do we do that? Um, we show up with a lot of curiosity um, mm -hmm. and even, even in moments of like fear or when we're scared of what might happen, we really try to support our staff to show up with curiosity as much as possible and to embrace discomfort. Discomfort is just part of being a person, actually. Like being a person navigating the world is sometimes an uncomfortable experience. In relationships outside of work, there's discomfort or there's conflict. So we acknowledge that that's gonna be part of the work in our service relationships as well. There's gonna be discomfort, there's gonna be conflict. And we really try to support staff to embrace that discomfort to lean into it and see it as an opportunity for learning and growth in those relationships and understand that discomfort is again, just part of life. And the job is not to prevent service recipients from experiencing discomfort or pain. The job is to support them when it happens, right? We can't actually prevent someone from experiencing a hard time. Um, and in doing so, we might prevent them actually from learning and growing if we try to like limit their choices. Um, 
we also just under we we sort of approach the work from this place of like nothing is nothing is permanent necessarily we don't expect or treat someone as if the experience the emotion their current circumstance we don't expect that to be permanent or treat it treat it as if it is permanent we do really believe that there is capacity for folks to change and we show up to the work that way and i want to be clear that is not that is not us saying that we believe that people must change it's just that we believe that people have the capacity to change and that day to day a person can be different or have different mm -hmm. needs different expectations different limits or boundaries different desires and also again that just people have the capacity to change and we have an endless belief in people's capacity to change and be different if that's what they want for themselves Thanks, Jay. When when you were saying all of that, all I could think of is is how we really practice meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go into a meeting with these cre preconceived notions or assumptions of how a person is going to present. We need to go in with an open mind and open heart and 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 ask them where they're at, what they need, what their wants are, um, and then go from there. So Pathways Vermont encourages and supports staff to show up authentically in relationship with service recipients and fellow staff. There's some when when you're meeting with somebody, uh, check in with yourself. Ask if you're being you, if you're being the real you. Are you in this together with that individual or are you doing things for instead of with? Take that like mental check. Check in with yourself. Be humble and be curious and hopeful. Curiosity has come up a couple of times throughout this presentation because it's really important asking questions, being present in conversation and, and being optimistic and looking toward the future are all, all part of what makes us work. We're gonna talk just a bit about lived experience and then wrap up our uh, presentation here for some questions. <clears throat> So every couple of years, we do a survey of our staff to learn more about the lived experience of our staff. As we've said, we think that lived experience is an asset. We know that we hire staff who have lived experience. So from our most recent survey of, of lived experience on our staff, these are the results. 78% of our staff have a lived experience of mental health challenges. 43% of our staff have lived experience related to substance use challenges. 60% of our staff identify as having some lived experience of trauma. 43% of our staff have a lived experience of homelessness. 17 individuals who work for Pathways have lived experience of hearing voices. And 21 individuals who work for Pathways have attempted to take their own life before. I know that these can be this can be a fairly sobering slide. Um, it's important though. This really informs the way that people show up to their relationships within our work. It informs the culture at Pathways Vermont. Again, we think that lived experience is an asset, that being in community together, talking about the things that we've gone through, talking about shared and similar experiences can really deepen and enrich our relationships with service recipients. Like Jay said, it can really deepen and enrich our relationship with service recipients. We ask a lot of the people that we, we meet with, we want to hear their story and sharing your story can be can, can offer like discomfort um, and it can be something that we may not want to want to do. So it's important that we're willing to do what we ask another person to do. Right. And that's sharing about our own lived experience. And at Pathways, we consider lived experience to be an asset. It's not they hired me in spite of blah, blah, blah. It's it. We really identify those as being being fundamental and and um benefits to the work that we do and the connections that we form with individuals. We have folks with lived experience across the agency in administrative roles, direct service roles, and leadership roles, including our very own executive director, Hillary Melton, who we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And lastly, I just want to draw attention to our Pathways Vermont Training Institute. If you look, there's a handout about our training institute that includes the different trainings that we offer, uh, some of which are related to things that Tia and I have been talking about. Uh, if anyone would like to learn more about that, you can reach out to me. Uh, but just quickly, our training institute has provided training and technical assistance, technical assistance to a variety of individuals and agencies around the world. Our goals include providing a foundation for a human connection approach to service delivery, which is what we've been talking about, supporting new programs to implement housing first with high fidelity to the evidence based practice and supporting system change to end homelessness in communities across the world. And as you can see, we've had clients and folks uh, 
across the world, both nationally to the United States and internationally. And so again, there's a handout if folks are if folks are interested, you can check that out and feel free to reach out to me about it. You can contact me at j at pathwaysvermont.org or at training at pathwaysvermont.org. And there's Tia's contact information as well, which is Tia at pathwaysvermont.org. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. We're open for, for questions now and happy Wonderful. to talk with folks. Thank you both. That was hugely informative. And even though I've uh, seen your presentation before, there's always things that I learn and, and you kind of slants on things that, that I take from it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to counteract your one cow per 3.8 people with three sheep for every one person in Wales. So wow. just, just <laughs> to bring the animal facts to the rural uh, kind of countries and states that, that we're working in. Um, thank you so much. I know that will have been really invaluable, particularly to uh, some of the people working in local authorities that are more rural in Wales, and um, particularly those who are maybe don't have housing first yet, but certainly there are plans to expand it across those rural areas. So thank you so much. Um, really fantastic. Um, to see uh, the stats around tenancy sustainment, um, you know, time spent in institutions, people not being charged with new crimes. I think that's just such amazing evidence that kind of makes that case for housing first and also the cost effectiveness, um, I'm sure brings some public services on board uh, to uh, show that additional support rather than just it's the right thing to do. Um, it was also really interesting to hear about um, how you uh, operationalize a service around the local, regional and statewide footprint. Um, because I think often people think, oh, it either has to be local or regional or national, but actually you've managed to merge all of those different approaches and target those things, you know, at the appropriate scale. So really, really fascinating and definitely um, food for thought. Um, in terms of the local service support, so you've got clearly a really extensive multidisciplinary team there. Are those professionals um, all dedicated to the service or are they, do they have another day job and they're only offering kind of part of their time to the service or are they wholly employed within your Housing First service? The majority of our staff is wholly employed by Pathways. Our doctors um, are with us one to four times a week and they have uh, roles outside of Pathways as well, which just kind of in, uh, increases their area of expertise, you know. <laughs> Definitely. And it, it feels it's really interesting. We've been having discussions earlier in our conference today um, about how Housing First in, in Wales and the UK tends to be funded by housing. Um, and there are often real struggles trying to get health and, and mental health mm -hmm. kind of on board strategically, but also creating that timely access at an operational level. Um, you've been funded and are established as part of the mental health system so does that mean that you've actually from the very start been able to have much more rapid access to specialist mental health services for example in the cases where you've needed them <laughs> i i think our our wait time is is equivalent to that of, of everyone yeah. else in the community. You know, sometimes we, we may have um, a strong connection with an, another organization and be able to partner up. But for the most part, it, we're just like everyone else out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because we, we were hearing some research earlier that, that it kind of tends to be down to like individual relationships or people maybe in health who are super passionate and kind of make things happen, not mm -hmm. because of the system, but in spite of the system. So it's really interesting um, to, to reflect on that. Um, we've had uh, a couple of questions in on the chat. So um, Alex said, um, he's just heard mention of uh, congruent homes, i.e. group homes, not being used to accommodate people leaving prison um, and instead in favour of that independent um, accommodation. Um, that's certainly a stance that, that we take in Wales. We much favour the dispersed model rather than the congregate model. Um, could you uh, maybe expand on why you think that independent homes are important in contrast to congregate models? So <clears throat> independent housing really gives that person that sense of, of freedom and choice and fully prepares them for when they move on from pathways to integrate into the community in their own permanent housing situation. The congregate housing, oftentimes people have um, compared it to still being in facility in whether that's in incarceration or in hospital because they don't have as much freedom and choice and autonomy with how the ways in which they want to live. Um, 
and they can also and and sometimes a lot of times they are housed with with people who they've known from from their past so it can make moving forward even more difficult for them jay do you want to, do you have anything that you'd like to add i don't think so other than just as you said yeah really that emphasis on like autonomy, right? That when people are able to have their own independent housing, they're just able to be more self-sustainable and not bound by the rules of other people. And I guess some of the things that you were saying about small communities, and we've talked about this at the Housing First Wales Network, how sometimes that sense of everyone knowing everyone's business can sometimes lead to the stigmatization and the difficulty in, I guess, leaving behind a reputation that someone might have gained through their response to trauma earlier in their lives. So how, how do you manage that? How do you, you know, I guess you talked about how once people see the results, they're really positive about it. But in the early stages when, you know, people might be uh, less sympathetic, less compassionate, how do you go about trying to make sure that someone does have that equitable access to housing and they're not stigmatised by the community? Well, our housing team has established relationships with a lot of landlords. And so often um, if somebody, if they know that somebody's working with pathways, that can be an advantage because they know that they're going to get wraparound services and support. And they know that this person has some lived experience, you know, that that oftentimes is not their fault. And in our community, we, we, we have good communities and they want to help people out, you know. Um, in our Department of Corrections program, uh, the individual is actually leased to us and we're leased to the property owner. So we have like a stock of apartments that um, are at our disposal for when people are coming out of incarceration that we can put people in. So that also makes things easier. So um, there's always some apprehensions to letting people who don't have a strong rental history move into a unit, but Pathways will take on that responsibility of ensuring that any damages and such are, are taken care of, or if there are housing emergencies, you know, we're there to, to take care of them as part of that transition to somebody's own housing where they're leased directly with a property owner. Excellent. And yeah, we've had similar discussions about the benefits of leasing schemes in Wales as maybe a kind of route that helps to, you know, give that confidence initially, you know, mm -hmm. by having that that kind of partner who is kind of taking some of the risk around housing management as well. Um, we've got a question um, from Joe who said, um, you've said that the whole team work with all of the clients. Um, how do you do this? Um, do you take turns with support? Um, and, and do service users gravitate to certain members of staff? So quite often here in Wales, there will be a dedicated support worker um, who works with um, the Housing First client. And, uh, you know, the, the client may well know maybe one or two other support workers, but they've kind of got a clear relationship mm -hmm. with one person who then kind of, I guess, opens doors and helps them to access other, other specialist support. So um, how's it work in reality with, with the different uh, members of the support team all having those relationships with the client? Well, as Jay mentioned, we all have ACT meetings in the morning, so that's an opportunity for us to read notes and go over the shared caseload to find out what people's needs are. We try to rotate the staff that they see. And yes, yeah, somebody may may have um, a connection, a different connection of one staff than they do another. Um, but on the basis, we can all do the exact same thing. And then we bring our own unique perspectives and experiences and approaches to a relationship. And so we really do encourage um, the the clients to meet with as many staff as possible because it does it is the basis for like expanding their community right you can go from having one service coordinator with one client and that could be that relationship for years or you can have one service coordinator who's connected to five different people you know or more and and that really opens them up to different personalities different um interests different lived experiences and again it, it really it quadruples or quindru I don't I can't think of the word, like their their community, especially if if at the start their only community is pathways. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Tia. Um, another couple of questions from the chat. So Chris has said, thinking of the New England winters, do you see <laughs> seasonal fluctuations in presentation or service uptake? Um, and also what was the age spread across service users? Um, do you have many young people under 25 who access your provision? I know that um, we have a veteran who is 97 years old, 
and we we do start working with people young adults um but often uh the majority uh, not the majority um we don't have i would say jay correct me if i'm wrong we don't have as many people under 25 as we do who are over 65 maybe yeah i think i think that's true when i worked on a housing first mm -hmm. team we supported at that time that, that particular team supported about 40 people and I think three of them were 25 and under. And I think that was actually sort of remarkable. Like we, yeah. we had a 19 year old at first and then we got like another 19 or 20 year old. And that was something that stood out because most folks are a bit older. And it seems like there are more um, resources out there for younger people. So mm -hmm. that may be one of the reasons they don't immediately come to us because Pathways is often seen as like the last stop. Like people have already experienced and exhausted other resources in the community and Pathways is like um, like the caboose on the train, you know? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And, and seasonal fluctuations, do you kind of see that or is it a fairly constant flow um, of people accessing the services? Mm -hmm. Say it's a fairly constant flow um, yeah. needs can can differ during during the seasons you know um somebody it seems people have higher needs in the winter time and are are have uh, more going on um during the warmer months you know life is a little more exciting and stuff during the warmer months and there's more connections outside of pathways during that time great thank you um, and paul has asked do any of the people you support through housing first live in shared housing um, for example, to young people living in a two bedroom apartment because they want to have company. This is really exciting. We actually have a roommate situation with um, two of our Department of Corrections um, clients. They're two older gentlemen who have been who were both incarcerated for quite some time who don't have um, supports outside of, of paid supports in the community because of crimes and how long they've been incarcerated. And that's working really, really well. And we're looking to do that more um, across the state, particularly in our Department of Corrections program. Um, one bedroom units are hard to come by, uh, but two bedroom units are, are seem to be readily available. And so if we can partner people up, especially where the relationship will be beneficial for both parties, we are really trying to um, do that, take advantage of that. Oh, that's that's really interesting, particularly in that in, in that circumstance. And I guess where, where that's a client choice and that's benefit and there's absolutely kind of no good reason, really, if if that works for them, why, why they shouldn't do that. And, mm -hmm. and you've touched upon this access to housing and affordability. You know, how does that work in Vermont? Because in the UK and in Wales, it's an absolute nightmare at the moment. Rents are sky high. There's a real lack of truly affordable properties. Is that a challenge that you share in Vermont? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and it how, is. Yeah. We're, we're in a housing crisis. Yeah. yeah. Is, is the leasing schemes, I guess, a, a way of trying to make sure that you secure so, some properties and have those available to people? That's one way. And we have a really robust um, housing team that works kind of tirelessly across the state. And they have some already established relationships. They have many already established relationships with um, landlords. And so if a unit comes up, sometimes the landlord will let us know because they, they want to continue to help their community and, and they know what pathways can bring to the table. Um, but the pandemic really highlighted how many people were unstably housed in the community. And from the pandemic, luckily and thankfully, a lot of housing vouchers that weren't previously there came about, like our CARES program. And so we've got a lot more people accessing housing. So we're trying to keep up with that demand. Um, but it, it it's a tireless effort and, and hopefully um, one that will be resolved in the in the future with more um, just our affordable housing being built. Yeah, for sure. And, and then just a, a final one before we finish. So, um, I guess, you know, you've built really strong relationships now and you've got, you know, a range of services and individuals who really believe in the service that you've delivered and the outcomes that you have. But back when you started the programme and maybe 
lots of agencies weren't aware of Housing First, didn't really understand what the model were um, was like, didn't really know about the international evidence. How did you go about kind of educating and convincing people that they absolutely should fund this, they absolutely should partner it and, and provide properties? How did you approach that, um, particularly in the rural context where it feels quite different to urban areas, where I think certainly in the UK in urban areas, homelessness feels like a much more immediate problem because you see the rough sleeping in city centres, whereas in some of the rural areas, there could be a tendency to say, oh, it's not a problem here. Um, so how did you go about kind of convincing people that Housing First was the right thing to do and to get behind it? Well, we um, we grew exponentially in the last 12 years or so. We only had a handful of clients when we first started um, and only a handful of staff. But we, we grew so quickly because we do have an evidence-based practice and we have an executive director who, who knows, knows what to say and, and, and is really compassionate and well-received by the community and, and was able to, to convince people to take a chance on us. And um, it is a small community and everybody knows everyone's business. And so word got around, I think. And again, um, we have really robust teams that specialize in each area to help build those relationships. Fantastic. Um, well, that has been an amazing session. Thank you both so much for, you know, meeting with us early in the morning for you, end of the day over here. Um, but it's been such an invaluable session. And I know that particularly colleagues who are working in some of the more rural and local authorities will have taken huge benefit and learning from that session. Um, so thank you so much both. It's been an absolute pleasure to welcome you to our conference today. Um, and, you know, please do let us know if there's anything that we can do to support you in the future. We'd be more than happy to do thank you very much Tia and Jay thank, thank you. you so um that brings our housing first Wales conference 2022 to a close um thank you so much to all of our speakers. We've had fantastic sessions from uh, the Minister's address about her vision for Housing First in Wales, hearing from Jo and Alex reflecting on the Wallaches Housing First Wales accreditation process, going up to Yorkshire where I'm from and hearing from, uh, from Basis Yorkshire about Housing First for Women and how they specifically support sex workers. We've also had a really, really interesting debate about Housing First and the concept of graduation with our colleagues from Homeless Network Scotland, from Homeless Link and Joe again from the Wallach. Uh, we've had a fantastic presentation from Gareth, who, despite the fireworks going off outside his flat, was an absolute pro at continuing to deliver that presentation and some really interesting and thought provoking issues raised there. And finally, um, we've just heard from Jay and Tia, who've delivered an outstanding presentation on uh, delivering housing first within rural areas. I know uh, the conference has left me with a lot of food for thought. I hope it has done the same with you. I hope you found it inspiring and engaging and that some of the values and issues that we've talked about today will help you to go on and deliver and develop Housing First in Wales. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to our speakers who gave up not only their time but their incredible expertise today. I'd like to thank you as attendees for coming along and taking part. We've had some fantastic questions and we really, really appreciate that engagement. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the staff team behind this conference. Um, as many of you know, we're a very, very small team here at Cumorth, um, but we work really hard to try and put on good quality events for you. And I have to say a big thank you to Wilf, who is our events and marketing officer for leading on this event today. Um, a quick reminder that you'll receive feedback forms. Um, please do fill those out. Um, we do read them and we do take notice and we want to make sure that the events in the future meet your needs and we improve wherever possible. So please let us know what you thought of today, what we can keep doing and what we could improve in the future. And for all of those of you who registered for this conference, you will get links to the recordings of these in the next few days. Those will only be available to people who were registered attendees. So please do look out for those um, and you'll be able to catch up on any sessions that you've missed or any that you just simply want to rewatch again. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Have a lovely rest of the day and I hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>